radial head and neck fractures. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Thomas Krupko and Amsaka Brahman narrating. So these are the objectives. We're going to go through the anatomy, talk about elbow instability, talk about classification of radial head fractures, uh, treatment, and then also talk about radial neck fractures, their treatment, and wrap up with Essex Lopresti injuries. So in this first video, we're going to focus uh, mostly on the anatomy, um, on the uh, concepts of instability, and surgical approaches. And then we'll talk more about treatment in the next video. So the superficial lateral elbow anatomy, it's important to review, uh, especially for surgical approaches, uh, and of course where the radial head and neck are. So understand where the uh, uh, superficial landmarks are. You can often palpate the normal radial head uh, in many patients when you supinate and pronate and get a sense of where that joint line is. Here you can see some of the important lateral anatomic structures. It's also important to understand the course of the posterior interosseous nerve and that uh, its position can change slightly based on supination and pronation of the forearm. So you can see how the um, PIN nerve is brought further away from the surgical field when you're operating on the radial head and especially the neck. Uh, in pronation as opposed to in supination, um, it is brought fairly close to the radial neck if you are working on the proximal radius, for instance. So the uh, deep anatomy is shown here, the uh, lateral ulnar collateral ligament, the uh, radial collateral ligament, annular ligament. So these are lateral ligamentous structures. A little bit of a deeper uh, inspection demonstrates uh, here the uh, radius has been resected, so you can see what's essentially deep to the radius in the lateral elbow. Uh, the lateral epicondyle, uh, on the humeral joint, the coronoid. So in uh, the lecture on terrible triads and unstable elbow, we talked a lot about how you can access the coronoid um, in a terrible triad once you kind of move your way past the fractured radial head and work your way from your from the inside out. So here you can see the radial head's been resected. So this is what you might sort of see, um, at least a portion of this. The exposure may not quite be this extensive. In the surgical field, on the medial elbow, here you can see the anterior bundle of the MCL, posterior bundle, transverse bundle, with the, all the uh, other soft tissues dissected. So stability, well, you have the static stabilizers, right? Um, those include the ulnohumeral joint, the radiohumeral joint, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, the anterior bundle of the MCL, and the dynamic stabilizers, which are the common flexor origin, common extensor origin, biceps, brachialis, triceps. So the radius um, helps to resist axial load and valgus stresses. Um, and you know when you have con when you have an issue like posterior lateral rotatory instability, for instance, in axial load and valgus, the radius due to ligament incompetence is going to uh, be able to sublux, for example. Um, so uh, it, you know, and if you have a case like going back to the terrible triad concept where you don't have an intact radial head, you really need something there, the uh, reconstructed head or possibly a replacement to help resist axial load and valgus and instability. Mechanism of injury is typically a fall into outstretched hand with axial loading and valgus force. Um, so in the top left, you can see the elbow reduced and then with posterolateral lateral rotatory instability with valgus axial compression and supination, you can see how that radial head goes from here uh, into this position slipping posteriorly, and then it can become perched and then frankly dislocated. So any treatment requires a complete understanding of the injured bone and soft tissues, um, and CT scan can help with this. Um, so there is this spectrum of uh, injury from 
uh, relatively simple elbow, dislocate, uh, elbow dislocations where you have a pure ligamentous injury and uh, oftentimes can have a stable reduction afterwards. You can do early motion uh, to cases where you have more complex elbow dislocations uh, leading to the terrible triad, which is a form of a complex elbow dislocation when you have a radial head fracture and a coronoid fracture along with the ulnar humeral dislocation. So just focusing more on the radial head fractures, the Mason classification is pretty widely used, so it is important to understand. Type 1 is a fairly non-displaced or minimally displaced fracture as seen here. Uh, this is where you may have to look for other signs of the fracture, such as an elevated posterior fat pad sign uh, on the lateral radiograph. Uh, for example, that may be a hint that perhaps is a radial head fracture that you have to look a little more carefully to, to identify. So with this, there's typically no mechanical block to forearm rotation. So you should be able to supinate and pronate them if you're not sure. A lidocaine intraarticular block can help uh, at least minimize the pain and allow you to get a better exam for a mechanical block. The Mason type 2 is a displaced or angulated fracture. Um, so in this case, you have uh, typically a you know, fracture here. You can see there's uh, a double density here with the fragment displaced, uh, but uh, not, in, not significantly comminuted. Now, there may be a possible block to rotation in the Mason type 2 fractures. Mason type 3 are comminuted. So in these cases, um, it's not you know, one simple displaced fragment, but you have multiple fragments. Um, the implications of this are that um, when you start to think about, for instance, you know, terrible triad injuries and fixing versus replacing, you know, in the Mason type 3s, you may be a little bit more inclined to replace. Um, at least you know, that may be many surgeons' preference. Uh, whereas in the uh, type 2s, these are frequently fixable. And we'll get to this in uh, the next video. So in the, t in the type 3s, there's typically some kind of block to rotation. So the Mason type 4 is added later. This is the Hotchkiss modification. This kind of bridges a gap with more complex elbow instability. And this is when you have a radial head fracture with an elbow dislocation. Uh, so in these cases, you have to be aware of lateral ulnar collateral ligament avulsions from the lateral epicondyle, uh, as well as, you know, the, the whole package of the terrible triad injury. So this is a treatment algorithm you can use um, where you think about fracture signs of the radial head. Uh, and if it is minimally displaced, uh, you can often institute early motion uh, and if you don't, remember, injuries in the elbow have a tendency to go on to very rapid stiffness. So if you really do have a Mason type 1 injury, uh, minimally displaced, you probably should be initiating early motion. So if they splint that patient in the emergency department, they, they should be coming to see you in the office and hopefully within a week or so, and you should be able to confidently start them moving. Um, so if it's a displaced fracture, then you have to decide if it requires operative management or not. Um, I'm sorry. If, yeah, so we're, we're, we're down this pathway here. Um, so if you have larger fragments, um, you may potentially need to do operative management with open reduction internal fixation. So if it's a really small fragment and it's blocking motion, sometimes you can excise it. Whereas if it's a displaced fragment, let's say you have a Mason type two, uh, it's displaced, and um, then you have to make a determination, is it fixable, you know, if it's a Mason type three actually, or do you require arthroplasty? Um, if you have a displaced fracture and, um, I'm sorry, if you have a non-displaced, so if you have a large fragment with a non-displaced fracture, uh, you may be able to consider early motion if there's no block to motion, right? So if you have a fracture uh, that's large fragment, not displaced, and um, 
you can uh, convince yourself that there's good supination and pronation, you can often treat them with early motion. The problem is if there's a block to motion, now you're going to have to intervene and go down this pathway. So this is a reasonable way to, to think about this that incorporates Mason classification, but also makes you think about like is, you know, is the fracture something that's large enough to fix or um, is it small enough that it should be excised? And then really keeping in mind motion, block to motion, and is this something that um, is uh, causing that and requires treatment? Let's talk about the approaches. So the uh, approaches to the radial head generally are lateral based, and there's a few different approaches uh, for those of you who have access to OTA online, uh, I encourage you to check out some of the high-quality videos there, uh, OTA.org, and uh, OTA online has a great uh, library of videos here. So the Coker approach is one of the most often used for the radial head. The interval is between the inconeus uh, and the ECU. Uh, this keeps you pretty far away from the posterior interosseous nerve. Um, the incision will look something like this, right? And it's angled posteriorly about 30 to 45 degrees. Um, so the, uh, you know, this will put you right in line with the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. So you have to be careful that you don't completely disrupt that. Uh, but you do tend to stay a little bit further away from the posterior interosseous nerve. If you pronate it, you generally will be safe compared to some of the other approaches where it's a little bit more at risk. So the Kaplan approach um, is an approach where which can be extended uh, distally into the dorsal Thompson approach. So let's say if you have a uh, radial neck, neck shaft fracture, and you need to expose the radial head, but also the neck and into the shaft. So sometimes you will have these comminuted fractures that are not just the radial head and neck. So this is a good approach for that. The intervals between the ECRB and the EDC uh, shown here. Uh, so here you're a little bit more in line with the course of the posterior interosseous nerve. It's, it's palpable between the two heads of the supinator. So um, if you are going to be you know, heading a little bit distally into the dorsal Thompson approach, you, you have to really find it and dissect it out, uh, in which case you can identify it and preserve it. So PIN injury is something you've got to keep in mind here. You can see some of the cadaveric uh, specimens demonstrating this. There's also the OTA online video. And here you can see the final approach and exposure gives pretty wide exposure, you know, with that dorsal Thompson extension distally to the proximal half of the radial shaft. There are other approaches. Uh, EDC split is kind of halfway between Coker and Kaplan approaches. Uh, pros and cons are similar. It puts you a little bit more in line with um, if you need to instrument the radial uh, neck and shaft, for instance, when you're doing uh, arthroplasty. The modified Boyd is another uh, approach, the posterior approach uh, that can be used for combined olecranon radial head fractures. And uh, in the references, uh, at the end of the next video, you'll see some of the references for this technique. All right, so we're going to um, pause here and uh, pick up in the next video where we'll recapitulate this treatment algorithm and then focus a little bit more on treatment.